Hello, I'm Brian Lawrence. This talk is from a keynote that I gave at an internal UX conference called Design Days. The topic today is design operations, also known as design ops. If you're watching this, this probably means you have a background in design or research. Maybe you are a UX designer, a researcher, a software engineer, or a product manager, or even a product owner. So take a moment and think back about some of the challenges you, as someone in software development, has faced. I think back to the time I was with the UX team at Cerner and can remember a ton of challenges that we were facing. Challenges related to culture, people, onboarding, training, challenges related to practice, the user-centered design process, for example, project management, challenges related to infrastructure. And when I say infrastructure, I mean design standards, asset management, software, hardware, and even digital asset, assets. But the bottom line, there were many, many challenges. And as a UX team, of course, we'd address these, but it really wasn't until the end of 2020 when we decided to take a step back. You see, we had been together for a while and our team had massively expanded. We basically had outgrown our original structure and it was time to reorganize ourselves to account for that growth that we've experienced. So we started on working on what that new structure should look like. We reached out to leaders on the team um, and others on the team and started to compile suggestions. We identified problem areas, probably similar to what you had thought of when I asked that question about problems you faced. And we started talking and discussing with our employees. Uh, we even had an employee survey to see what our employees thought was working and what wasn't. In fact, it was one of our employee surveys that clearly called out the need for some change. During this time, one of the decisions that was made was to create a new operational role focused only on design operations. You see, up until this point, no one on our team only had an operational focus. Everyone had operational focus on top of their other core responsibilities, you know, whether those responsibilities were research, design, people management. And to be successful and meet the goal of optimizing research and design, we really needed focus and also we needed someone to be accountable. So a new role of design operations manager became a reality. And that's why I'm talking about this today. So who am I? First, I'm a lover of tech, uh, continuous learning. I'm a husband, I'm a father, and I, I'm a world traveler. In terms of work stuff, I've over 20 years in software development with most of that time in healthcare IT. I've held various roles, starting as a software engineer with Siemens Healthcare, now called Health and Ears. I became a scrum master at that time um, and eventually became an engineering manager working for Siemens and then Cerner Corporation, purchased our divisions at Siemens, and I became a UX manager. And before I left the corporate world, the reason I am talking about design ops was because I took on that role I mentioned, that design operations manager role, and I conceptualized and formalized uh, design operations at Cerner, of course, with support from my leadership team and the entire UX organization. Now, since I left the corporate world, I've been in multiple roles. Currently, I'm a tech consultant, I'm a software engineer for my own company called uh, Spiro Adam. And most recently, I am coaching uh, as a career coach for engineers and engineering leaders at Mento.co. Today, we have a pretty for straightforward agenda. We're going to look at the why, the what, and the how of design ops. And if I end on time, hopefully, um, we might have time to answer any questions. Well, actually we won't because you're YouTube, but I, I welcome any questions in the comments and I'll be happy to answer any. So first, why? So I was curious about what ChatGPT would say about the design ops role. 
So I asked, and this is the response I got. Software development companies need design ops to streamline and integrate the design process within the development life cycle, enhancing collaboration, efficiency, and the overall quality of the product. Whew. Okay, well, thanks, ChatGPT. Not too bad, but let's let's move on. ChatGPT says streamline and integrate, but I prefer to look at some of those common challenges first. After all, a common challenge could just be an inefficiency. We already thought through some of those ca common challenges today when we started talking. So let's think of a common challenge. I think of culture, challenges with culture, the onboarding experience. Imagine you just start a new job and it's your very first day. Well, I remember this exact scenario for some new hires on my team. And this was pre-COVID, so they actually started on campus. Picture this, you walk into a room of people all starting at the same time. Awesome. You get to your seat and later in the day, everyone gets their work device. They hand you a nice brand new HP laptop. Wait a minute. Didn't the interview say that this organization uses Sketch for design here? And last I checked, Sketch doesn't work on HPs. Yep, yeah, this is a real example of situations that happened to newly hired associates on my team. More than once, I'm sorry to say, and in some cases it took days to get the right device. Then once they got the device, they needed to open five or six different tickets to IT to get the appropriate software, including Sketch. So all in all, a week goes by and finally they get their device and their software installed. If they're lucky, a week, if they're lucky. Whose fault is that? The new employee's manager? Me? Well, that happened and that story is all about onboarding. But when you think of culture, you also think of people in general. And I also think of communication and it can really be a challenge and not, not only to onboard, but once you have someone onboarded, how do you keep them up to speed? How do you keep them trained? Not only on the latest trends with in your industry, but the things that are happening and going on within your company, within your UX department. It's challenging. And communication, you know, in general, humans are really not good at communication. And as a result, we will always see challenges with communication. So why design ops? Challenges with practices, the last minute request. Most companies obviously don't have enough UX research and design to go around. Well, this was absolutely true in my previous company. Despite us having a large team of 150 researchers and designers at one point, there were still plenty of development teams in the organization that literally had no UX support, none. I recall one time a team had requested support the last minute request, right? And I was happy when this happened because it meant that our communication efforts were working and word was getting out that yes, you need UX. But it was clear that still people didn't understand how the UX process should work. So they requested some help for a very important and very urgent project. And the only thing we could afford, unfortunately, was what we called a consult, which helped with some very minor cosmetic concerns. But it was obviously already way too late in the game to have a real impact. The good news here was that later, this team decided to invest. And they allocated some funds to get themselves a dedicated UX designer. The reason this happened was because we had been introducing new UCD processes, integrating that into the company product management process cycle, and honestly, just maturing as a UX organization. And honestly, design operations was part of making that happen. So design ops, that story ties to practices. And within practices, I consider project management part of that. I mentioned that consultation. So due to limited resources, we had instituted consultations when there was no way to assign a researcher or designer to a product or a project. But as you are all aware, practice processes, project management, you see, process and integrating into your company's product development process can really be a challenge. Other challenges. Okay, challenges with infrastructure. 
So how many of you have had to deal with a decision maker? A challenging decision maker, maybe a product analyst, a product owner, or even a software engineer who also designs on the side as a hobby and they bring their ideas to the discussion. I remember a designer on my team who was assigned to a very challenging team. And honestly, it wasn't really the team itself, but the person, that decision maker on the team. And it was difficult because they had an opinion about everything. And a decision maker on the team, let's say a product owner, should have an opinion for sure, but about the requirements, not necessarily the workflow that is best for the user, especially not the micro interactions on the UI. Well, every UX decision that my designer made became a battle. I mean, everything. I recall talking in one-on-ones about this or that. And when we finally figured out what happened, we realized the problem was that this particular team had designers in the past who only had time to create wireframes. They would come in, create a mock-up for the team, and leave. And that was it. The other problem, however, was that this particular team was being built in a legacy system that was built on old technology. And while we had design standards, those standards were not yet pushed to this team. As a result, we tweaked the standards specifically for their product. And from then on, the challenge of micro interactions, at least, was not a debate. We also clearly set expectations by using our design frameworks. Which makes me think also that these might be challenges you face. You know, when we think of challenges in infrastructure, I mentioned design frameworks. Some questions for you. I mean, do you have design standards? What about a style guide? Do you have digital assets that make it easier for you to create mock-ups without reinventing the wheel? And does that align with your style guide? What about common design patterns? Asset, asset management also comes to mind. And by asset management, I don't only mean making sure you have that nice new MacBook Pro and super nice monitor with the software. You know, I'm also talking about other types of assets like digital assets. I'm sure you can think of other challenges that you face on a daily basis. I have even mentioned I haven't even mentioned, honestly, the time that you spend on things that are not design related. Well, the good news is design ops is for you. So we just looked at the why. We desperately need design ops to address common problems in research and design and software and development in general. Let's talk about what is design operations. And to do that, we'll start with a quote from Dave Malouf, the one who coined the term. Dave is currently a director of design operations at Teladoc Health. And he says that design ops is everything that supports high quality crafts, methods, and processes. So if you want high quality crafts, methods, process, design ops will help. Dave also provides some insight into what he believes operations is. He says that operations is tools, infrastructure, workflow, people, and he calls out governance as well. Thanks, Dave. And if you're watching this, hi. Okay. When I was first introduced to the concept of design operations, it was from an article sent to me by the Nielsen Norman Group, also known as NNG. And NNG, they organized the idea of design ops using what they call the design ops landscape. If you do a Google search for design ops, a definition by NNG will probably be what you see with a link to the article, the Design Ops 101 article that introduces this landscape. And really, this is a great, great way to understand what Design Ops is for sure. And I base a lot of how I operated and conceptualized Design Ops at my company based off of this as a starting point. So we saw how Dave and NNG refer to, the, to Design Ops and what it is. Now, let me tell you how I like to think of design operations. I like to think of design ops as a combination of culture, practices, and infrastructure that enables research and development optimization so UX professionals can focus on what they were hired to do, design delightful software. Now, I stole that idea of delightful software from my previous boss, uh, Paul Weaver, who 
was leading our team at Cerner and is currently um, leading design at Hyatt, actually. He had a vision for software at Cerner and healthcare in general, and that it could actually be delightful if we did it right, <laughs> instead of, well, not so delightful. Um, you know, I do have confidence that Cerner and other healthcare providers like Carillon and uh, others are now moving in the right direction and hopefully are building delightful software. Hopefully delightful software will exist in the healthcare system at some point in the near future. Uh, you might be thinking, okay, well, that's great, Brian, if it's delightful, but if it's not usable, it's pointless. Well, of course, you know, when I think of delightful software, usability, accessibility, solving, actually solving and providing the solution for the user is part of that. So yes, um, delightful software obviously has to be usable. All right, so we have a high level de definition of what design ops is, a system for optimization tied to culture, practices, and infrastructure. But the key here is that it gives time back to our researchers, our UX designers and researchers, so that they can do the job they were hired to do. Now let's talk about how, how can we do this? So how do you design design operations? As I mentioned already, when we first started this talk, I was given the task, the full-time task of conceptualizing and implementing a design operation strategy. Was I scared? Of course, but it was also pretty exciting. So I approached the problem as any good designer would. What better way to design design operations than by using the double diamond method of design? So I put together a six, six month plan to discover, define, develop, and deliver a working design op system to the organization. To start, we had to define what we thought ops should own, and then I discovered what was being done on the team, who was doing it, and what the current state was, so I could take ownership moving forward. The next several slides will walk through the areas we as a team identified to live within operations. This does not mean that these may be the areas you might want to focus on first. It is just what made sense for our team at the time. So why don't we start with culture? So culture, I think we've talked about culture already, but when I think of culture, of course I think of people. And I think of communication. If we take a look, a deeper look at people, the way that we approached it was that we decided design ops would be the main point of contact with HR, uh, recruiting in our contingent workforce group. I mentioned we had a team of 150, which translates to many managers hiring. And I did my best to be the bridge between all of our managers and those people departments. This was especially helpful when HR would push an initiative. I was able to understand the request and then coordinate with the managers on the team and make sure we did our due diligence. A good real example of this was figuring out a consistent plan for what to do after COVID. Do we re-enter? How do we re-enter back into the office? Those types of things, which probably is still a work in progress, honestly, even um, now in 2023. Um, the other thing that we thought would make sense that would fit under here would be team education. And one of the areas of improvement identified by our employee survey was to provide time and better education so our UXers could develop their skill set. By having someone who owns this and is responsible for making sure it happens, I was able to get two full team trainings by NNG group scheduled, um, while also getting some internal courses available to interested employees in addition to becoming the point of contact with the larger education team, bridging the gap. And then onboarding, so think back to that challenging onboarding situation that I mentioned earlier, the story. Now, this was originally owned by several different people. We had one associate who had revamped the onboarding experience and did a fantastic job for designers. Th thanks, Brad. Um, and that was great, but the challenge there was that other people on the team weren't following it. So what I was able to do was take ownership, get to a committee together, and starting 
started to make some traction. So and making sure that when new employees joined, they were properly onboarded and also that we were learning from our mistakes, continuous improvement. OK, in regard to communication, so. Depending on your team, if you're from UX, you know, one question is, does your UX team is it big enough to have internal meetings? How often do you have them? Who owns the agenda? Who runs the meeting? When you have a team of 150, this really is not a trivial task. I took the ownership of the meeting schedules, the agenda, the scheduling, the emceeing, our monthly syncs. And this basically meant I was responsible for, for making sure that those one to two hours we spent together every month was valuable. A team wide internal communication was also something that we included in this area. And what this looked like was design ops owning the email distribution lists, other internal channels, such as our team's channels, we were, we were a Microsoft shop, and sending out the occasional email as a reminder, whether that was about a timesheet or important information, such as COVID response stuff. Uh, this also included updates to leadership about what was happening in the design ops space. So I put together a monthly design ops report and reviewed it with senior leadership every month. It contained updates about each area in the design ops space. And finally, external communication. So our UX team at the time already had some external communication presence, including a Twitter account and the occasional post on Medium. At one point, there was even a monthly newsletter that went out to clients. Um, and this, this was kind of a tough area to figure out. The way I approached it was I connected with the larger company leaders within our organization. I connected with marketing and social media and then work created a committee, communication committee to come up with an external communication strategy that was approved. OK, so let's move on to practices. This is basically the process you have put into place or your organization has put into place and expects you to follow. So for us, this was an interesting one. Our organization was adopting a new way to practice product management. And the key to all that was that we as a UX team were engaged in that process. And we had been. We had already identified several leaders on the team to figure out our UCD or user centered design process. And the way we had to figure this out was to get them integrated with the larger organization. Now, um, in my organization, this didn't necessarily fall under design ops for me. But it certainly is part of design up. So something you should think about as well as you're thinking through your own unique situation. Uh, practices were also thinking about, you know, project management um, and also budget. So project management, let's start with that. Um, I had mentioned my office responsibilities actually didn't include project management because we had another team within our organization that dealt with this. And honestly, you know, if if you were doing it right in my perfect world, project management should just include UX. You should have a project management in your organization that covers everything, not just the design space, but the all the spaces from product to engineering. That's ideal. Now, unfortunately, if you are in an organization that doesn't have enough UX resources and you have a central pool, for example, of designers supporting multiple projects, as requests come through, you need to be able to determine who works on those projects, right? So ideally, like I mentioned, the company would handle that project management. But if you're in that situation, you have to. That's a UX organization. OK. Um, also, just tracking progress to assure the UX professionals on your team have everything that they need to do their jobs. You know, what if they're blocked waiting on a business analyst to prioritize a request? What if they need a little bit more help to influence? What if a researcher and a research recruiter isn't getting the support they need to find participants for the study? This could also be included here. Now, I mentioned I'm a little bit about UCD already, but someone must define what this is and the process your team's going to follow and how that process integrates with the rest of the company. Uh, this again wasn't my responsibility we had a focused team to define how we did ucd but it should fall um, within the design out space at least should at least be covered there should be accountability here and you know the important thing about this is once you do define what that process is 
people on your team need to understand how to follow it. You know, that not only do your designers and researchers need to understand how to do the UCD approach, but the teams you're working with need to understand the importance of it, why we're doing it, and have to be on board with doing that, or they're not going to give you the time to do what's actually needed and to be able to follow that UCD pro process. So another thing to consider, uh, again, it wasn't directly tied to design ops, but it should be included in my opinion in design ops. Now, uh, this last one, budget is pretty straightforward. So depending on who your team reports up through, you may fall within an existing budget or you may have your own budget. In our organization, we had a budget and design ops was responsible. So I was responsible for making sure that we had the money we as a UX team needed to do with our jobs. That included money needed for software, licenses, and money needed for travel, when we could travel, money needed for education, you name it. And you need to make sure that you have a good steward there. You need to make sure that you're a good steward with your money and you need someone to track that budget and approve requests. And we put that under design ops. Whew, lots of stuff. Okay, infrastructure, the next and final space we're gonna look at today. I know there's a lot here, hopefully this helps. This is basically, infrastructure is basically everything your designer needs to do their job. If you have a car or a train ready to take you somewhere, but no roads or tracks, well, you're not going anywhere, are you? And for our team, we broke it up into two spaces, asset management under infrastructure and design frameworks. Now, asset management, this could include hardware, I made sure that our UX team had laptops, monitors, mobile devices to do their jobs. Uh, the way it worked for us was that I was the point person with our enterprise asset management team. I made sure that as new employees joined, they had what they needed. They had a MacBook. Or when there was a problem, you know, with the MacBook that they had or any hardware device, they were able to quickly get a replacement and able to resolve it. Software making sure that your team has the right software to do their jobs. I was the point person with the software management team, uh, making sure we had the licenses we needed. In my case, I also had a UX tools committee that we met once a month, and we discussed any new software tools that we might want to investigate. We were sketch shop at the time, and every month Figma would come into the picture. Uh, so it was kind of a fun job. Uh, digital assets. So. Question, does your team have a central location for icons? What about other reusable components like libraries or templates that may be needed to align with the design standards? So your UX designers don't have to reinvent the wheel every time and can simply pull in those com components as they design the product. So at my company, we had a team responsible for creating those assets and it wasn't explicitly under design ops, but it certainly could be the case. Our team was also a sketch shop, relying on sketch libraries, like I mentioned earlier. That was kind of important. Um, finally, under this space was design frameworks. So design frameworks consist of many things. You may have, may have a published set of higher level design principles to guide your team or how on how to approach various user needs. Um, you might have design standards, which is a little lower level, that lower level guidance that your team should use as they, as they design. Um, and also you might need some visual standards your team should be following. I mean, there may be a brand uh, department within your organization and they might want you to also follow the branding principles. So this could also be a spot for you to connect your direct team with the branding team. But visual, you know, visual standard style guides, that's what we were talking about there. Icons, color, palettes, those types of things. Okay, so that was how we approached using culture, practices, and infrastructure. And a little bit more about this, you know, we really walked through a deep, deep dive there on how I did it and how I approached it. So you might be wondering to yourself, okay, great, I see how you did it. I understand the challenges now. I mean, I've always understood the challenges probably since you're living and breathing it if you're watching this, but how do you start? So uh, how, do you, how do you start? I suggest the following simple steps. You can do the double diamond approach that I did, or you can just do this. Step one, research. 
identify pain points. If you have done a retrospective or you do a retrospectives, do it again. But think about your processes, the challenges. What is keeping your designers and researchers from doing their jobs? Once you've done that and you've identified those pain points, step two is to analyze. Identify now, this is where it's kind of important to identify an owner, you know, whether that's one person or a team, and start analyzing those results and grouping or categorizing those into buckets using design ops as the framework. You know, like I approached it with the design ops fr framework being culture, practices, and infrastructure, but you could also use NNG's uh, de design ops landscape. It's really up to you and what makes sense for you. Step three is prioritize. So once you understand your current reality, prioritize what should be addressed first. What is taking the most time away? If you have, if you fix that one thing, how much time would your team get back? What is that return of investment? Change takes time, but you have to start. So, so where do you start? Do basically what you would expect your product owner to do. Prioritize. Step four, create a proposal. Determine who is the best person to receive this proposal. Most likely the one who has the power to approve things that may require money. Uh, cater this proposal to your audience. Most executives talk dollars. So figure out how much money you'll save if you do X, Y, Z by in investing in design ops. Show how much you save. You know, if you identify one person, for example, to own team education 50% of their time, and that takes 10%, gives 10% of time back to 10 other people, you're looking at a pretty good ROI there. Convert that into dollars. And then finally start. So make sure you come in with a pretty aggressive plan A, but also have a plan B, a plan C, a plan D, a plan Z. As a, a growing organization, you need to start intentionally working on design ops because here's a secret. And we'll come back to our good friend Dave here. He tells the truth. You are doing design ops now. Let me repeat that. Regardless of what you think, if you're a UX design team with researchers and designers, you are doing design ops now. But you can be doing it better with intent and focus. And if you intentionally Focus on design operations. Yes, you'll have optimization of research and development, less of those challenging teams. Yes, you'll have delightful software, less last minute UX involvement. And yes, you'll have happier developers. So less bad onboarding and better training. So we looked in summary here, we looked at the why, why to address common problems, we had stories about challenges that I saw in culture, that onboarding experience, in practices, that last minute request, um, and in infrastructure, you know, that challenging decision maker. We looked at the what, which was basically a system for optimization. So design and research can do what they were hired to do. We looked at the how, at least how I approached it. And for, for me, it was being intentional through organizing by culture, practices, and infrastructure with accountability. And that's the approach. Uh, this is a handout that you can get access to. Uh, just look in the, the details of this YouTube video. Uh, you'll be able to get that handout. But honestly, just it's time for you to do it. Uh, get out there. Be intentional about your design ops so that you all can continue to have a positive impact in whatever industry you're working in and so that you too can design delightful software. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, feel free to subscribe. I put out YouTube videos on all sorts of things. Uh, I'm a, as you know, I'm a software engineer. I'm a uh, technology leader. I put out videos about design ops mostly. Uh, I put out videos about um, software engineering, also travel. So if you're interested, feel free to subscribe and thank you so much for watching.